Hello, my name is Dr. Halil Mutlu. I am co-chair of Turkish American Nation and Steering Committee. TAS continues its global webinars on various topics with uh, very distinguished guests. I'd like to welcome all our viewers and Turkish Americans and Americans public. Today, we have a very distin distinguished guest, Professor Gülnur Aybet, and we're gonna speak with her about COVID-19 and new world order. On 31st December, 2019, 27 cases of pneumonia of unknown ideology were identified in Wuhan city, Hubei province in China. Cases were all linked to Wuhan's Huanan seafood wholesale market, which trades in fish and a variety of animal species, including poultry, bats, marmots, and snakes. On 30th January, 2020, the World Health Organization declared the Chinese outbreak of COVID-19 to be a public health emergency of international concern posing a high risk to countries with vulnerable health systems. It took another 39 days for the World Health Organization on March 11, 2020, declared the novel coronavirus outbreak as a global pandemic. As of today, global confirmed cases reached to 7,550,933 and global deaths at 422,135. Most confirmed cases are from United States, stands at 2,026,073, and number of deaths stands at 113,899. The global pandemic has changed our world as we know it. It's particularly devastating on every aspect of the life that we are living. Today, uh, Professor Gunnar Albet, Albet is our guest. With, uh, with your permission, Dr. Albet, I would like to welcome you to our webinar. Hello, it's a real pleasure to be here. Hello. I would like to um, read Dr. Albet's uh, biography. Gunnar Albet is Chief Advisor to the President on International Affairs and Security and Professor at Turkish National Defense. She was Professor of International Relations at Yildiz Technical University, Istanbul, between 2017 and 2019. And she was former head of Department of Political Science and International Relations at Bahçeşehir University, Istanbul, between 2014 and 2016. Between 2001 and 2013, she was a senior lecturer at the University of Kent, England, where she created and directed the first MA program in international security. She also held academic posts at the University of Nottingham, England, and Bill Kent University, Ankara. She holds a BA degree in economics and public administration from Royal Holloway, University of London, and MSc in international relations from the University of Southampton, and M. Philosophy in War Studies from King's College, University of London, and a PhD in International Relations from the University of Nottingham. Professor Ibet was a principal investigator to research projects funded by the British Academy, NATO, and TUBITAC. She has held visiting scholar posts at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars in Washington, D.C., and at St. Anthony's College, Oxford University, where she was also a senior associate member of the college. She was a member of the World Economic Forum, Global Future Council on Europe for the period, period 2019 and 2020. In 2009, the Times nominated her as one of the top 20 most powerful Muslim women in the United Kingdom. Dr. Ibet, again, welcome. Thank you. The global pandemic has changed our life as we know. It's particularly devastating on the health economy, international relations, travel, social life. 
borders are shut, countries and local economies came to a screeching halt. Businesses have ceased operations. Long-term financial costs may not be known for years to come. So far, only global airport industry lost $300 billion globally. COVID-19 is making us to learn a lot of things, such as epidemiology, virology, diagnostics, and treatments. We watched governments respond to the pandemic. For Turkish Americans, we had the opportunity to compare both governments, Turkey and United States, respond to this serious health threat. Uh, Dr. Ibet, I would like to direct you my first question. COVID-19 has struck us, the, the, the world, at the time of a transition. This transition, which was from a declining liberal world order to another system, which is still in the making. Can you please explain to us the world order before COVID-19? What kind of world order should we expect after COVID-19? <laughs> As you rightly said, I mean, these are enormously big questions, of course, but um, the world order uh, as such uh, is still in the making. And, uh, and the post-19, uh, if you like, 1945 world order that we have, which is basically from the Second World War onwards, is largely a sort of globalized uh, world order uh, based on free markets and uh, liberal economics and uh, liberal values, in fact, you know, Wilsonian values, if you like, uh, and based on the trust of robust international institutions. Uh, however, I mean, that system, of course, was a bipolar system for uh, throughout the whole uh, duration of the Cold War. And then after the Cold War, we saw this sort of lull in the 1990s, where we had the triumph um, of the Western world and uh, this globalized, uh, free market, liberal uh, world order and its institutions. And uh, for at least, I think, for 10 to 15 years, uh, in the transatlantic core of this order, that's Western Europe and America, uh, there was this general notion that the entire world would now want to join this and everyone should, you know, prosper and be free in this. Uh, and of course, uh, some of that euphoria uh, and very um, unrealistic expectations uh, were shaped because of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the very successful absorption of the post-communist space into the Western world, uh, Eastern, Central, Eastern Europe. Uh, and of course, throughout this time, we had the successor states to the Soviet Union and Russia uh, was relatively weak. So it actually went along with this sort of rather uh, designing period, as I call it. It was a period where the West really, under American leadership as well, had a free hand in sort of designing and, and reinstating the liberal world order in the 1990s. And we saw this reflected in academic studies. We saw it reflected in the books of that time from Fukuyama to Eikenberry after victory and so forth. But also academia itself was... Uh, uh, very much, uh, you know, focused on how uh, values and norms, uh, liberal norms, should be transferred to other regions and other countries and how these norms should be uh, absorbed. But, uh, you know, the, as a grand design, it was okay. But as we know, you know, you make plans and then life turns out to be something else. And this is what happened to the world. Uh, and uh, you saw different things happening. So such as the rise of instabilities, non-state actors, uh, challenges to the liberal regime. And then you had um, a resurgent China, a resurgent Russia. And so this liberal world order, which had reached its zenith in the 1990s, was already being challenged. And the world order was already in a transition before COVID-19 hit us. So this is the point where we were when COVID-19 as a, as a pandemic hit the world. And the immediate impact it had is, first of all, it's going to actually probably speed up some aspects of this transition. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, it's going to 
uh, challenge uh, a lot of these norms, particularly uh, globalization as we know it, uh, in many ways. So I think I'll stop there and let you continue. Otherwise, it's going to be a monologue. We want to have a conversation here. Uh, but just to kick off, I mean, this is where we had left off in world order. So it was already going through a transition. And then COVID ha happened. And now we're sort of uh, picking up the pieces and trying to muddle through this. Yeah. Uh, as I understand, uh, the, the world was going through, through a different uh, uh, new order, especially after World War II, uh, is my, my understanding. Uh, liberal world order uh, was in place and the global economy was uh, led by the United States. Uh, as you mentioned, that you know, there was a bipolar world. In this in this scheme of bipolar world, uh, you mentioned uh, some non-state uh, orders and elements, and uh, some, if I can, if I may, call it rogue states uh, or terrorist organizations or what have you. What do you think about uh, these these elements' involvement into this liberal order? How did it change the, this order? Well, the bipolar. Uh, you know, structure of this order lasted only throughout the Cold War, as long as there were two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, and in fact, if you were a student of international relations back then, life was reasonably easy. I mean, we were all very scared, of course, because of a impending nuclear war. That was a reality. You try to explain that to my students now, and they have no idea what you're talking about. It's the new generation, but mm. um, they don't remember the Cold War, of course. But it was a real threat, I think, you know, nuclear war that would have ended the world. But uh, apart from that, it was a very stable world, the bipolar order. And uh, as a student of international relations back then, uh, all we need to to do was follow what the Soviet Union and the United States were up to and how arms control talks went in Geneva. As you know, the world today is much more complicated, especially for international relations students, because they have to study a variety of things to understand the world. So at the end of the Cold War, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the bipolar world came to an end. What we had in the 90s was what Charles Krauthammer called the unipolar moment. That was America being the sole superpower. Uh, but that now what we have is uh, a very loose multipolarity with uh, various power centers, Russia, China, uh, India as well, uh, all these rising economies. Uh, and of course, the changing structure of what was the transatlantic core, which is Europe and America together, uh, forming the heart of this whole liberal order. Uh, and of course, Turkey as well. Turkey's changed too. Uh, and sometimes it becomes very difficult to read uh, when you're looking at it from the West. Uh, because I think, you know, a lot of uh, analysts and policymakers, uh, particularly in Europe and America, for quite some time uh, continued making sense of the world within the parameters of the 1990s and thinking of Turkey as the country it was in the 1990s. And of course, the world did not stand still. And Turkey has changed, the world has changed. And I think one of the drawbacks of all of this is how much the transatlantic core were not, were in denial, if you like, of changes that were happening. Um, and of course, there's a fear behind that as well. There's a fear of Russian resurgence. There's a fear of China. Um, and there's, there's a, the fear is actually uh, welded in not understanding. You always fear what you don't understand. And I think this has been one of the things about, about Turkey as well. But it was after the 1990s that you got new phenomena on the world stage, such as global terror after 9-11. Uh, and we had this phenomena that was affecting all of us in the sense that you had terrorists plugging into virtual cells that didn't exist. I mean, think of, for example, I mean, I grew up in the United Kingdom. Uh, the United Kingdom had to deal with IRA terror for many years, uh, but that was a structured, you know, uh, counter-terrorism, if you like, uh, when you look at it from the point of view of the UK state, because you knew where the IRA came from, how they were structured, what their political motives were, and so forth. Uh, but 
after 9-11, you got this thing of global terror where terrorists around the world with different ideologies, different groups were plugging into the same networks to obtain their ideas, uh, their supplies. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example from, uh, from NATO was actually saying that uh, for one roadside bomb to be constructed in Afghanistan, it was actually brought in from 30 different networks in 30 different countries. So you can see how terrorists are so plugged into these international networks and how it's very fluid and they're virtual cells, you don't get to see them. Somebody forms a cell and then they do something and then you can't trace them. So this is one of the new aspects of the international order that really hit us. Uh, after 9-11, that we, we were all facing this, and uh, particularly like um, the more tangible elements of the terror, for example, that Turkey faces, is also plugged into these international networks. So uh, th this is one phenomenon. The other thing is, when the liberal, those who, uh, if you like, are in charge of the liberal world order, like Europe and America, um, particularly American leadership after 9-11 and the intervention they did in Iraq in 2003. Um, after that, it became uh, sort of trying to make sense of the world happened by calling states that did not quite comply with this world order as rogue states. Hmm. And then states where uh, there were spaces that were ungoverned that were leading to, for example, terrorist cells to be uh, to be there, uh, such as Afghanistan was. Um, those were called failed states. And suddenly this gave Western leadership a self-righteous claim that they could go and put things right in these places. And this was something that was sort of, that, that they inherited again from the early 1990s. And, you know, there, there's a very good reason for that because the euphoria of the first Gulf War was huge. I mean, here you had one member state of the uh, United Nations invading another member state, Iraq invading Kuwait, right? 1990. It's a clear breach of international law. The United Nations Security Council passes a resolution for sanctions and the military action. So all of this is perfectly legal. There's American leadership, but also Russia's there with America. Well, Soviet Union was still intact then. And then you have local actors who are, you know, coming in. So it was actually a perfect intervention in terms of military success, but also legitimacy. And this really gave, I suppose, leadership in the West the notion that, yes, we can put things right in the international system when we need to. And I think that placed the bar so high that next time something bad happened somewhere in the world and they couldn't do it, it just seemed as a failure. Uh, similarly, the interventions in the Balkans and Bosnia came too late, but still it was an intervention. And yes, it's not a perfect state, but somehow, you know, there was leadership there and something got done at the end. Similarly with Kosovo, but once you get to Libya, you have this intervention and then they disappear and if they just leave it into pieces, Syria, no intervention whatsoever or bad intervention, a very piecemeal that doesn't produce results. So what we got was this euphoria of 1990 lingering on and then this disappointment that no, maybe we can't fix everything. And then this questioning, should we be fixing everything anyway? Um, but then, and I think, you know, the, the West was really, I mean, I'm, I'm being very sort of general here. You can't label something as the West, of course, but generally speaking, the transatlantic core and the institutions that matter, you know, like NATO, EU, American leadership and so forth. Um, you know, there, there was a general unwillingness, I think, to fix things after a certain point. And then we entered, I think, from uh, almost the sort of early years of the Syrian civil war onwards, this muddling through attitude of what we should do. Uh, and with that, of course, as this new phenomena emerged, such as international terror, or what they would want to label as rogue states, not, not even wanting to engage with them, which created a problem in itself, or doing unnecessary, I suppose, interventions, 
uh, in other regions of the world. Uh, this all created problems of its own. And as we were muddling through all of this, then came COVID-19. So these are, you know, already this new phenomena in the international stage had emerged before COVID-19. But this is, of course, <laughs> the COVID-19 crisis is really forcing us to think out of the box. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose states who will be able to think out of the box sooner than later will be regarded as more successful. And this yeah. is what's so unique about this crisis. Um, here um, at this moment from um, where you left off, um, the existence of this order always depended on the existence of another. Uh, yes. This usually came in the guise of an ideology. Uh, unfortunately, you know, what we are seeing in the 90s and 2000s that uh, Islamist terrorism, the word which we uh, completely disagree with, particularly after 9-11, uh, came to stage. Uh, what do you think about this? Why, why I mean, um, we know that terrorism existed in uh, various parts of Middle East, but do you think this was uh, intentional or do you think this was... Uh, just a simple, pure mistake using the, this, this terminology, because as you know, Islam uh, and terrorism, two other uh, things that they, 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 they do not match, and Islam doesn't support any terrorism whatsoever. And it's very offensive to millions of Muslims around the world to have this label Islamist terrorism. You don't hear this being associated with other religions. For example, you know, the very tragic terrorist attack that happened in New Zealand. Uh, it was never called in the international media as Christian terror. So, you know, this is this is a real pro problematic in labeling things that I think, you know, that we also need to address. Uh, and maybe COVID-19 is also forcing us to think outside the box in terms of addressing how we label things in the international system, because until now the monopoly of labeling things in the international system was held again by this transatlantic core. And uh, the, the whole sort of Western security community, as I call it, you know, the, this whole NATO, EU, OSCE, the Europe, America, you know, coming together and doing things um, and, and creating this great blueprint of the 1990s for the, a resurgent liberal world order. Um, a, a lot of that, you know, um, that, that, that is uh, very much um, uh, interested, I suppose, in putting these labels and has an ownership of labels. And it really, this global world order uh, from 1945 onwards, and then its resurgence as a liberal world order in the 1990s, really depends on having an other uh, to justify itself and legitimize itself, because uh, it's not just a system based on power. You know, you could have a system that's just based on military or economic power, but this is actually a very normative system. It, it, it sort of it projects its power through being an inspiration, uh, by having values. Uh, and in order to do that, it must always legitimize itself in preserving a certain value-based order, a certain way of life as opposed to another. So during the Cold War, it had the perfect setup because you have the, all these nice values wrapped up under a sort of global free market, democracies, liberalism. And then what do you have on the opposite end? You have communism, which is an ideology. Now, once the Cold War was over and then you had 9-11 terror, then you have something again, which you can label that you can't understand, but you can say the other. And then you have like international terrorism, but you label it in that sense, like Islamist terrorism, which is wrong. Uh, and then uh, similarly, for example, states that, uh, I've, I've heard this word before, it's very condescending, but it's also another Western phrase. The condescending part of it is like, Turkey has now strayed from the fold. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what does that mean? It means Turkey is not behaving in a certain way uh, that the transatlantic core would like it to behave. Uh, and then uh, countries that stray from this fold are then automatically labeled authoritarian. And we see this, you know, it's um, labels are very powerful because especially when they come from 
a very strong normative core. But what is happening now uh, is very interesting because what we have is a challenged and sort of weary liberal world order. Um, but on the other hand, there are reactionaries to it. So on one hand, there is this old decaying liberal world order. On the other hand, you have its reactionaries. Who are the reactionaries? Far right groups, racism. And then you see this clash, but it's happening in the West. It's not happening anywhere else in the world. It's, it's, it's becoming a European and an American problem. Uh, and now you have two ideologies that are clashing in both Europe and America. Those who would like to preserve a globalist liberal world order and those that would like to have inward looking policies driven by the right. And they are clashing now. And this is what we're seeing. And it brings us to the point where, you know, is there an alternative to this? I mean, is the world going to be just about those who want to uh, preserve a liberalism that has become a little erroneous, a little tarnished in the last few years, uh, as opposed to a resistant, reactionary, inward-looking right-wing movements. And yes, there is. There is an alternative to this. Mm -hmm. And it's a new model, I think, that is being forced on us by COVID-19. And that model is precisely what Turkey is aspiring to be. And I think here, Turkey could be the model country in this. Why? Because this is a country that's seeking to be self-sufficient in everything it does. Uh, mm. Self-sufficient, independent, and less reliant on global value chains, supply chains, but still a global trader with an understanding on win-win concept for everybody. So I think this is a probably a new way of looking at things, which is something Turkey's been trying to do, but I don't think the rest of the world were quite understanding that very well. And they'll probably understand it better now, I hope, uh, that we've got to this point where, you know, uh, you need, yes, you need to be more self-sufficient. This is COVID-19 has taught us this. It's going to have a profound effect on global value chains, global supply chains. Um, so the global economy is going to be working differently. Um, countries are going to want to look for alternate supply chains um, uh, or being less reliant on global ones. Uh, but at the same time, they're going to want to trade. There's going to be more cooperation, but it's not cooperation modes or methods as we knew it. It'll be different. So, you know, it's, it's a tough time, but I also think it's a brave new world in terms of opportunities. Um, I believe uh, this is what you're calling needs-based uh, yes. new world order. Yes. Um, and, and you have given some examples, for instance, um, United Nations, for instance. Do you think there will be a change in the structure or the way that the United Nations uh, practices? Well, I mean, uh, that, that has been something that has been uh, debated uh, for a long time, not just by Turkey. Um, you know, as you know, you know, our president has repeatedly said, you know, the world is bigger than five, which it undoubtedly is. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a structure that, you know, was found on, on the conditions of the day at the end of the Second World War in 1945. And international law, as we know it, is embodied in the UN Charter. We don't you know, have anything else to guide us in terms of relations between states. All other conventions are sort of, if you like, tied to that main body of international law. Um, now, international law before the UN Charter was largely based on custom. It's what we call customary international law uh, because there is no international government. States, after a while, get used to behaving in a certain way in their transactions. And it, it actually, um, they, they like that. They favor that because it gives them a sense of predictability. So if you're, state, if you're trading with another state, you have certain relations with another state, uh, just as they have expectations of you, you can also have expectations of them. So this is actually interest driven. Uh, and that's why states value some sort of rules, regulations and order. 
Otherwise, why would states put themselves under any rules or regulations? They don't have to. You know, there's no international government. But they do this out of interest because they like to have some kind of order in their relations with each other. So the UN Charter was the first time a lot of these practices became codified, written. So uh, we can't really, I mean, it's going to be very difficult to change that. But the way we practice international relations has also come under a lot of changes and we've stepped out of the UN Charter many times, the intervention in Iraq in 2003 and Kosovo and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of things you can say that this is illegal, it's not, you know, according to international law, but then, you know, who's to put it right? No one, you know, unless states come together, there's leadership and political will, no one's going to put it right. Uh, so it's a very difficult task to actually take the UN, shake it and, and redo it. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but what we can expect is new modes of cooperation that don't necessarily tie themselves to international institutions. As you know, there is a declining trust also in international institutions, mm -hmm. which is not a good thing because they were uh, you know, created uh, because of that trust and they were created to regulate relations between states but if we have a declining trust in international institutions this is also very bad for the international system but unfortunately this is where we are today uh, the eu has less leverage uh, the un doesn't seem to be you know stick it standing up to the role that it had in the early 1990s um, so a lot of things are being challenged uh, but that doesn't mean that international institutions are going to go away. I think they will become more and more uh, functional institutions. They'll become facilitators uh, between on relations between states as facilitators. Uh, but I think states will be the main drivers uh, for how to cooperate with each other. And it will be needs-based. Needs-based is basically this. Rather than saying, I must cooperate in this certain forum with these states because we've signed this agreement and we're so alike and we've been together for many years, let's just do this as we've always done it. It's not going to be like that anymore. It's going to be something more like this. Take um, the vaccination, for example. Everyone's trying to find a vaccination for COVID-19, right? Yeah. So, you know, one... Maybe a group of scientists in one country that are working on it are going to make um, immense progress. And then they might come up uh, with a deal with a company in an entirely different country and different region of the world. And then that partnership might then tap into totally different supply chains that were not there uh, for that company or those scientists or that country, uh, not utilized by those countries in the first place. So. The modes, I think, of cooperation are going to be transactional. Um, and this is where states need to adapt themselves to that. And our concept of power, I think, is also changing. So when we think about power, uh, we were always looking at it as the economic power of a state, uh, the financial power, the military power. Of course, these things are still going to matter. but I think uh, if a state is able to adapt itself to these new modalities of cooperation, uh, to these new ways of doing business in the international system, uh, the more adaptable, the more flexible, the more speedier uh, and more results oriented a state can become, uh, that state is gonna be more powerful. So it's gonna be less material uh, power is going to be less material, but it's going to be more about how a state can adapt. And I think here again, Turkey, uh, from what I can see, has really got an upper hand there. Uh, the way I, I just finished uh, about a year ago, a study that I did for Tubitak on the Syrian refugees, for example, and I studied how state institutions in Turkey adapted themselves to this uh, enormous uh, burden of looking after uh, 3.7 million refugees. And at one point, you know, hundreds of thousands were being processed at the border. Uh, how did Turkey do this? 
they adapted their institutions with remarkable speed. I mean, at one stage in the early stages when refugees were coming over, the simple construction of field hospitals adjacent to the border, for example, is a remarkable story that we don't really tell that, that well abroad, but it is a remarkable story because it's not easy to do. You know, you try to set up field hospitals and because I'm gonna to come to COVID-19 now, because uh, Turkey's institutions have this experience of adapting themselves so well, that is why this health system that we have, not only is it robust, but it's also been able to adapt itself um, with the COVID-19 situation. So while, uh, for example, in Europe, um, hospitals didn't have enough intensive care units, and they didn't have enough beds. We were only using 60% of our capacity when uh, the COVID-19 had peaked, uh, which is why we, we have the highest recovery rate of patients because we're able to look after them. So uh, I think this is very important, adaptability. Of course, material power matters, but the power to adapt, I think, is going to be huge after COVID-19. Um, what do you think states have to have to be able to adapt quickly uh, to these to this type of changes in the world? And my, my other question is, will they be willing to adapt or change, especially some of the countries in the region and in Asia, which may be more authoritarian? Yeah, well, they have to. I mean, I think, like I said, these labels are not going to be very helpful. At this stage, um, countries may have different governance systems, but at the end of the day, if you have a crisis and it's on your doorstep uh, and it's affecting your population um, and it's global, then you have to adapt yourself uh, and you have to look at it as a results oriented. I gave you the example uh, of the vaccination, for example, as a results oriented search. Yeah. Uh, for example, you know, the, the EU have started their own, you know, initiative, which Turkey has also contributed. Authoritarian states or states that, you know, may have a different uh, background, uh, that would, they, would they agree with the uh, international world to uh, look in, into the future and make some changes and adapt themselves for the future? Yes, I, I think, you know, like, as I was saying, the, the, the labels here in terms of governance, uh, will matter less rather than short transactional results oriented cooperation. So I was giving you the example. I think this is where for the vaccination, for example. Yes. Uh, Europe have their own initiative, which Turkey have joined in, but the United States started their own initiative under the Trump administration, and he basically said, uh, the President Trump said that, you know, he would work with anyone who was going to get results first, even if it was China. So, which is a bit bizarre given the tensions between US and China, but you see, this is precisely the pragmatic results oriented, needs-based cooperation that we're going to see more and more. And, um, and I think, you know, uh, here uh, sort of certain reservations about not wanting to do business with this country or that, are going to sort of matter less. Uh, although we're seeing some strains, it must be said, between uh, the relations between China and the EU, uh, China and the United Kingdom. Uh, but still, I think there's also a search there to see how they can accommodate this relationship, for example, with China. So um, I think, you know, it'll be a much more uh, transactional cooperation uh, rather rather than one based on uh, normative principles, if you like. Oh, um, in, the, in the specific uh, example of COVID-19, it um, looks like you know, the future world will have a lot to, to share on healthcare. Um, yes. It looks like you know, uh, I may have chosen the uh, good, good business, good, good job for doing my you know, serving yes. people. Per, also, great I profession. Also, I think all healthcare workers, and I know you're a medical doctor yourself, really deserve the applause they're getting from 
country from their citizens all over the world uh, because they are the real heroes in all of this. And, uh, and they've really been in the front line of uh, this struggle with COVID-19. And I believe, uh, you know, the, the healthcare workers have shown how should this should be in the future because we really transcended the, the, the race, you know, ethnicities, you know, languages, backgrounds. Exactly. We, we focused on, you know, as you, as you say, needs based. Yes. What, what's our objective? Healthcare, saving people's lives. Looks like yes. we have a good exemplified. Do you think, do you think the world, for instance, you know, World Health Organization, as you know, they've come under such a huge fire by Trump administration that they were late on calling some of the some of the features of the COVID-19 as pandemic. Do you think the World Health Organization will be there and will, will it need to change its structure? Well, again, like I said, with institutions, this declining trust in institutions, uh, you know, I mentioned some others, but you mentioned the World Health Organization, that is likely to continue. But uh, the institutions are important because they have a long uh, sort of background and experience uh, in codifying relations, in dealing with the specific issue like health, in the case of the World Health Organization. Uh, they have their own agencies in place. These are all very useful. So I think that they will continue their work as facilitators rather than you know, setting the stage. The stage will be set by needs-based cooperation. Uh, but the facilitator will be, for example, the World Health Organization has done a study of all the different groups around the world that are working on the vaccine and at what stage they are at. Now, when you want this information, where do you go? You go to the WHO. Uh, they have that. So I think in that respect, they will be institutions, international institutions will be very useful in giving us that support that we need as, as facilitators. But, uh, you know, a lot of this will be needs-based. And um, we've also seen, you know, how this cooperation in terms of aid has been important. For example, a lot of countries did not see this coming, none of us could with the COVID-19, and they had not invested in protective gear for their healthcare workers. So they had sh huge shortages, but Turkey had a surplus. So Turkey actually gave uh, a majority of it was given aid. Some of it was contracted through companies uh, that states paid for, but a majority of it was aid that Turkey gave to 125 countries of PPE, protective equipment for healthcare workers, which is essential if you're working in the front lines. And you know, we've seen these terribly tragic pictures of healthcare workers in advanced economies uh, wearing, you know, bin bags to, because they don't have suits or, you know, using handkerchiefs. Pancho, we, we, we almost were going to wear, wear ponchos. For, for, for the so, instead and it's been much appreciated you know what turkey did there so i think again we're going to you know countries at that point that didn't say oh we don't want to cooperate with turkey right now they were very grateful and and they they thank turkey for that for that um aid so and and you know turkey rightfully did that too because wherever there's need if you're able to help you should uh, and I'm sure, you know, other countries, if they had the, you know, the means, they would have done the same. So now we're sort of entering that area uh, where I think it will be transactional. Yes, uh, very short term results oriented cooperation. But it will also be, I think, a kinder world hmm. where people will really look at basic human needs and see what needs to be done. And, you know, heads will come together and people will work together. It won't be about, you know, this is how I want things to be. This is my region. This is my part of the world. This is how I want the world to be. And you have to sort of come into the fold of this or else, you know, I don't want to cooperate with you. I'm just going to, you know, not give, uh, you know, uh, any, uh, in, I'm not going to have an interest in you. Um, I think, you know, rather than these very clear ideological or normative um, uh, reactions to each other. Uh, it's going to be people to people 
and needs-based. And therefore, I think it'll be a much kinder world. We really need that. We need we need yeah. kindness in this world. And we have, seen, we have seen that, that need uh, during the PPE shortages all around the world, Western world. And we have seen our part in the United States, as, as I said, you know, we were we were washing and reusing our uh, face masks, masks, N95s. We were running out of gowns, and you know, we were thinking of, about wearing the ponchos, the, those plastic, you know, raincoats, uh, things like that. It's really the world needs to work together in this. It's it's so hard for the lay people to understand how important that is to 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 bring kindness to what we do. Yes, absolutely. Bring kindness yeah, to what we do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the recent developments in the United States now, everybody forgot about COVID-19 now. Everyone is, has focused on George Floyd's uh, death and, uh, you know, the riots in the United States. There's so much anger uh, between different parts of the community. It's so sad to see that, you know, uh, yeah. a human life can be taken in such a way and uh, we have we need some sort of um, common sense come to sense and then and then tolerate each other understand each other better absolutely and also i mean there's obviously a lot of rage uh, but also there's been uh, rioting that's exploited this as well and same is happening in europe particularly uh, in london uh, and uh, what we you know people really need to realize that um, COVID-19 is still out there. So they have to still be cautious. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, what I'm really worried about when I see uh, these protests, a large part are peaceful, but then they're turning into riots or people are not being very careful in their social distancing. This is actually going to lead to a further spread uh, of the disease and, uh, uh, one has to, you know, uh, be aware of that uh, and keep your masks on and keep your distances while life goes back to normal. But when you have, you know, angry crowds uh, like this, um, and even with peaceful protests, it's difficult uh, for people to keep that distance when you have a large number of people coming to the same place. So, uh, you know, my message to everyone around the world, please be careful. Um, because yeah. it's still out there. Uh, be careful and protect yourselves. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, Arizona, uh, one of the southern states right now, is having its peak, and its hospitals are being overwhelmed as, as we speak. And yes. past Tuesday, only one day in the United States, two, well, 1,299 people died of COVID complications. Uh, so it's out there. It's still happening. Um, um, it at this moment, you know, we have, I believe we have done our part in a very small scale, though. Uh, in the United States, uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, replicate what our leaders are doing. Uh, in terms of PPE, when we saw this uh, need in the hospitals, we acquired some of the PPE materials as TAS, Turkish American Nation Steering Committee, and we have distributed these this PPEs to certain hospitals. And United States uh, congressman, congresswoman, for instance, Hewitt uh, Clark, Bill Pascarell, um, Brooklyn uh, Borough President uh, Eric, Eric Adams, Trenton mm -hmm. Mayor, and uh, C CEOs of the hospitals, presidents of the hospitals, uh, they, they were so thankful. They were, especially at St. Joseph, St. Joseph Hospital in uh, Patterson, they said that the, their PPEs had just finished on that day, that mm -hmm. the PPEs that would be brought were going to help them for a few days to give them the time, enough time to acquire a new, new batch of uh, PPEs, which they were so thankful for. And, you know, you know, out of blue, you know, people don't know each other, but this good cause can bring these people together and really appreciate each other. It was, it was amazing. Well, obviously, about the aid, um, you know, Turkey uh, gave to the United States, but also I think Task uh, also gave some uh, aid in that sense to some hospitals. I saw that. So any every little helps, you know. 
uh, this is the sort of situation that we're in. But it's it's very sad, obviously, uh, the peak numbers that we're seeing in the States, obviously a very big country. Uh, but, you know, in dealing with this sort of thing, uh, not only do you need society to be very careful in taking their own precautions, but you also need a robust health system. And I think every country around the world has learned that. You know, you can tell people to wash their hands, keep their distance, wear masks, but this thing is still spreading. And if your health system is not robust, then you're not going to be able to cope and become overwhelmed um, when the numbers reach, uh, reach high levels, which is exactly what happened in a lot of European countries like Italy. Uh, so I said, thank God with Turkey, I mean, when even when we reached the peak, we were only using 60% of our uh, healthcare uh, capacity. Uh, and now that uh, we have actually constructed emergency field hospitals uh, next to actually airstrips, uh, which is a new phenomenon, uh, I suppose, you know, in the future, uh, when there is need, again, addressing a needs-based world order, uh, patients uh, that uh, need to have emergency treatment can come to Turkey. Uh, yeah. And I think in that respect, uh, Turkey has also not only taken care of its own in this crisis, but actually opened a new niche for itself as well in, in terms of providing this service. That's also health tourism we are talking about here, right? Exactly. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Much uh, needed as well, yeah. Yeah. And then it's so open. Uh, in the United States, uh, some of the patients are being now sent to other countries like India, for instance, uh, getting yeah. you know hip surgeries, replacements, knee replacements, surgeries like and that. I think Turkey will be a leading country in this because we really do have the facilities uh, with these new hospitals that have been built particularly just for this purpose because they are next to airports and they're huge and they have state-of-the-art equipment uh, so they're, you know, ice from IC units to everything. So they're capable of dealing uh, with such demand if it should come from abroad. And I think there will be more demand for uh, health care that's there and readily available, especially as national, uh, existing national health cares around the world are unable to cope with things as, as they progress or they're not providing them at a, at a cost that is accessible to everybody. So uh, I think in that sense, Turkey will have cornered a niche. Yeah. Um, we are in the United States uh, and we're trying to uh, educate our own uh, Turkish community and American community about the issues that you know, really matter to us. We're trying to be a good bridge, a constructive uh, a bridge between United States and Turkey. How do you see uh, the importance of uh, civic engagement above, from the Turks to the United States? I think it's very important. At the end of the day, especially now, I think we're moving much more to a people-to-people -people world. Uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, healthcare workers, for example, uh, being very thankful if something package arrives from Turkey with regards to PPE, the person delivering that. So it's a much, uh, rather than government to government, we're seeing a much more people to people world. And in that, uh, in such a world, civic engagement, which is always matters, I think matters even more. Uh, particularly when you are engaging about um, not just needs based and help and so forth, but also in terms of informing the general public about Turkey and Turkish issues, but not just that, about the wider Muslim world, but also our region, you know, and I feel that people in America are not always that well informed uh, about these things. Um, it's a very, compared to Europe, I suppose, it's a much more inward looking country, uh, especially your media, uh, you, when I come to the States, I always notice there's always national news. There's hardly any international news. Uh, yeah. And the, 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 the news that people do get, they get it through very selective, you know, uh, outlets. Uh, there is still, of course, rife use of social media, but even that is focused very much on uh, domestic uh, issues. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, in terms of informing uh, in terms of engaging with people, uh, I think it's in, in tremendously important uh, to have civic activity. All right. Uh, we have come to the end of our program. Um, we had one of one hours of your time. 
Uh, we would love to be here longer. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping, praying that you will come back. And, inshallah. Uh, we will, inshallah. Inshallah, mm -hmm. we, we will have your uh, thought-provoking uh, conversations and, uh, you know, um, information. So uh, we will educate ourselves and our community. Um, looking forward to see you again. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Ibet, for being with us, here with us. I would like to thank all our viewers uh, for joining us. And, um, and we are not going to take questions at this time, but uh, next time, hopefully, inshallah, we will do, we'll do that as well. I would like okay. to give the last remarks to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mutlu, uh, for hosting me today at TASC and for your questions. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, thank you to everyone who's been tuning in and listening to us. I hope that you found uh, some of this uh, informative uh, as well as a, a lively discussion uh, that was fun to listen to. Uh, and uh, I just want to say to everyone, stay safe, keep your distance, wear your masks, remember to wash your hands. It's still out there and take good care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you.